went into the study, the research of the new year, the, the new year is 5784. And 5784 is very specific. You can look at the gematria, the gematria of, the, of, the, of the numbers and the letters that are coincide. So not looking at 57, but looking at 8, 80, and 4, um, there's strong gematria. One, one is, the fact is, 80 is the letter pay, which is the graphic symbol. <laughs> I don't want to give you too much because I'm really excited about it, but it's the graphic symbol of mouth. And I will do a teaching on it next week. So come next week expecting to, to me, for me to teach you. I'll just give you a little tidbit. So the, it's the mouth. So from the mouth, then there's the, the next letter, which is which looks like a door. They call it the door, but, you know, it's the delet. And delet is the, the Gamatra number of, of and I, I am ge completely geeking out on it, Gamatra number of four, right? But four that there's three meanings to it, not just door, but there's three meanings. One is the first meaning, the first meaning of the graphic is, is a poor man. The second meaning is door, and the third meaning is elevated. And so when you look at just the meanings, without breaking into the other stuff that I want to talk to you about, just the meaning, if you look at it, it goes door, it goes first, poor man goes through a door and is elevated. So if we look at this year, this year would be in 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 first first glance is the wealth 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 is going to come to the poor as they open and go through the doors of opportunity that's going to open up them to another place of elevation so 80 is mouth yes 80 is mouth and 4 is poor man door and and elevated oh boy we got into some fun stuff so i believe that god wants to bring us to a place that no matter where your position is if you may be poor in family poor in relationship poor in body poor in whatever but you have a door that's in front of you one of the scriptures that is just jumped jumped out me as, we, as i'm researching was the fact that god wants us to to have a revelation that there is a door in front of you but there's there's lots of adversaries. Now, the way the scripture actually says there's a great door and 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 it, it's it's um, effectual, open, effectual, open, right? Effectually open. So the way you're going to deal with it is you have a great door. The door that's in front of you is massive. The door is bigger than your enemies. I mean, I tell you what's really amazing. The door that God has for you is great. That's That word great I'm, I'm not supposed to be teaching this, but I'm excited. About it. The word great is the word megas, which is, you know, we me mega mart, mega dog, mega, mega, mega toilet paper, big, right? Massive, great, biggest door, unbelievable that they make it in this size. That great door is, is, is in front of you. So great door and effectual. Now that's important that you get that because the only way to get into the great door is you have to have a passion level that is driven that is active that word is is an inner geas, which comes from the word which is the word energy a level of energy that is active in activity towards it now everyone that's watching here is inner geas to to the doors that are in front of you whether you're writing a book whether you're getting ready for your public your know, public speaking whether you're preparing to 10x your business no matter what you're in you're in this position where you're ready to take your life to the next level. So we're going to, we're going to go to this next level with this. And God's pivotal picture I see is we're getting ready for the greatest wealth transfer there has ever been. Oh, my tingly is all over it. And the fact is, is we need that because of the problems that we're looking to solve. And I and I just picked one problem. I said the problem of of stopping human trafficking. My wife. Uh, has has had a, a significant um, effect in in helping people come out of uh, human trafficking. Um, she was almost captured when she was in Paris years ago. My wife's from Holland. Uh, uh, she was walking. She's she was walking on a bridge in Paris, and as uh, she was walking over this bridge, this car pulls over, opens up the side door, and then they tried to grab her and she held on to the bridge and just screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed and she didn't realize what was going on until years later that they were trying there was until we watched the movie taken and she saw what happened in paris he goes that's what they were going to try to do to they were trying to take her and 
we we find that you know she she has a voice to this situation. Well, as we go into this checking out what what is what do we do with this voice? And I'm like, okay, God, I work with business people. I don't know I don't know anything about working and helping her in this this field of of stopping human trafficking. And the Holy Spirit said it so clearly. He said, Tracy, human trafficking is a business. That's what they do. That's their business. The commodity is is the fact that they 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 traffic people like herd, right? Like a like cattle. And and he says if and he just says, Tracy, if you're going to help your wife, you're gonna help her because you're gonna deal with the business people and you're gonna transfer their hearts away from trafficking to to the value of of what God's calling them to do is really to be different. To, to do different enterprise, be enterprise, have enterprise, but be different. And I realized my connection with this was not just that I had to just support my wife because we're, we're a team. Um, I wanted to actually be more than just, oh, good job, babe. Good job. We're, we went on TV. I mean, it was explosive. They had so many phone calls regarding what she was sharing. And it's, it. but we found something. We found out that there is such a it's our hearts are lovely. We want it. We have mercy, mercy in our hearts. And, but the fact is, is we need the level of money that's that, that we need match funds is what I call it. If it's a trillion dollar, billion dollar business, which is a billion dollars, I think it was a hundred and hundred and sixteen billion dollars industry a year or something like that. It could be more now, but, um, I realize we're going to need match funds in order to deal with that kind of problem. That kind of problem doesn't get dealt with just because we're we wish upon a star, we pray, and we we do good works. I, I know we were doing good works. We're throwing a lot of energy at something that if we actually had a billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars, a hundred, we had match funds, we could actually move this thing further. And just write this down in your 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 little your little notebook wherever you write things down. Write this down and realize that whatever you're going to fix you're going to have to match it at, at the fund level, at the resource level. And of course, we pray for miracles. We believe God for miracles. The, the whole idea, God sending Moses to Pharaoh was, was, was an, and getting the people out was really about Pharaohs being matched at a different level, supernatural level, where Pharaoh, God came, you know, Moses came with a supernatural anointing that could match what Pharaoh was actually doing in his control. And, and what was really amazing, I, and I just want to say, I thought it was really interesting because when God gave Moses the power to go and stand in front of Pharaoh, he said, this is this, this staff right here, this is your key here. You drop that staff down and it's going to turn into a snake and Pharaoh's going to pay attention. Well, Pharaoh looked at the snake. I'm like, God, you, you, you had some bad intel. Pharaoh looked at the snake and said, listen, I have a couple of those over here. Two magicians come out, they drop both of their staffs. And the Bible says all the men's staff turned into, all turned into snakes. And I thought, well, that tells, what does that mean? The fact that they don't actually, they're not intimidated. The fact that we have supernatural power and prayer, they have that, they have that as well. But the superior greatness of our power will always consume theirs. And I love that great open door because what God's going to do for you, this open door, it may match other doors, but the greatness of that door. And so you have to prepare yourself for greatness in this season. Prepare yourself to be in a position where greatness is going to manifest in your life and God's going to do something with you that is supernatural, but it's not just the supernatural. It's the fact that how great that supernatural is. You have one, one door, one opportunity, one thing, and they have two, but it will always consume because of the greatness God wants to release on you. And I want to just encourage you that there's greatness manifesting in your life, but you're going to have to match the greatness with your level of energy, with your level of enthusiasm, with your level of activity. Don't let God put a great door in front of you and you don't match the level of activity. Now, this is not what I meant to talk to you about today. And this is just a review on my 5784 because the door is great. God's opening some big things. And I'm going to come back and talk to you about that next week. So pay attention, be aware, be ready for that. I'm going to come back and talk to you about that next week. Today, I wanted to talk to you. The reason I was sharing that the reason I was I was talking about all that it was because I wanted to give you an understanding that I believe that we're stepping into the greatest level of wealth transfer that we've ever encountered, that we as believers are going to encounter incredible wealth. 
incredible wealth. We're going to have opportunities with our activities as we match the great door. We're going to have activities. And I think the revival that we're looking for, the true revival that we're supposed to expect, is the revival of, of what I, I call uh, Psalms 37, 25, which is, uh, never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed or their seed begging for bread. The sin is begging for bread. I believe that God's going to bring such a revival that's an outpouring of just great revival, a financial revival, that we're going to be shocked in how God's favor flows with us with our activity. I want you just to accept that, write that down. God's favor flows with my activity. We write that down. God's favor flows with my activity. And one of the things that's necessary is that we not only need to anticipate to what we're going to receive, but we also need to be prepared to break. I mean, can I show you one, we'll share one more thing before I get into the training today? What I wanted to share is, uh, the second thing I want to share is that we are preparing for the season of, I'd say the next 24 months, where we need to be aggressively preparing for this transference of wealth. There's going to be some things that happen in, in you know, economics and, and things that happen in politics and but you can actually burrow past all of it. You can just push, push past all of that as you prepare yourself to flow with the activities of God. Let the favor of God flow with your activity. And so when you realize that, we're going to deal with one, one thing. And I don't usually get super spiritual here, but I feel like I want to get super spiritual in today. So if you're okay with that, give me a yes. If you, and and it, it may not be super spiritual, but we're going to get pretty spiritual because I know we're kingdom-minded people. And kingdom-minded people need to know that your gift of wealth creation and your business is not natural. Your business is spiritual. God wanting to bring wealth to you. God wanting to give you a message so that you can t turn around and train the nations. God giving you a coaching system. That is not natural. That is spiritual. And the less you see it as natural, the more you see it as spiritual, the more you feel the power of heaven come upon you in that favor released on you so you can step into the next level. Now, Luke chapter 16 tells us what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Luke 16, 13. So we'll read this. And if you, if you get overwhelmed with Bible, then, you know, come back another day. I'm going to probably next two weeks, just be hammering the Bible, just because we're getting ready for the greatest wealth transfer. And we need to have the biblical standard of what God thinks about wealth transfer and why God would want me to have it. And, and so we're looking at Luke 16, 13. It says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So this is a really beautiful thing because it's telling us that our service is super important. If you go avoda, if you remember the word in Hebrew, when he says, let my people go so they may worship me or they, they may serve me, is also the same word that's used for work, which is avoda, which is they are going to work and serve. In the Greek, it's different, but it's the same concept, that they you cannot work for God and work for money. But the fact is, is I, it doesn't say I shouldn't have money or I shouldn't have mammon. It's actually putting um, mammon in a position of, of, of personalization. It, it's now an entity. He's not talking about mammon as money. He's talking about mammon as a god, two comparisons. Now, mammon is a god. Mammon was a god that came from the Babylonian system. And Babylon had created this whole money system uh, based upon mammon. Now, mammon has a lot of meanings. We're going to come back to this in a second. Mammon was the god of, of Babylon. And when they're building the Tower of Babylon, if you remember the Tower of Babel, we call it Tower of Babel, but the Tower of Babylon, they're building the Tower of Babylon. They're building that tower. They're building that tower to wage war with God. Now, now they want to wage war with God because there's a there's there's a, the Hebrew concept that every, let's say, thousand years, there is some kind of turn against God to try to make humanity as God and take down God. Well, they were on a pursuit to build this tower to 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 create war with God. God came down and paid attention to the building because God is attracted to unity at every level. So God comes down, finds them unified, and says nothing's impossible to them if they stay unified like this because they are growing and they're growing and they're building and he's attracted to their unity, but he finds that their unity is based upon their own value system and not his value system. So he does something. He does something pretty amazing. It's not, it's not, he didn't come down and if I was God, I'd be, I'd be 
mean, Godzilla, uh, right? I mean, I mean, like, you know, King Kong tearing down the thing, but he doesn't. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this. Now, what you find is when you, when you have addition, you have, you have addition, not, not even multiplication, multiplication, but when you have something added, when you don't know how it comes there and why, where it comes from, it can be confusing when you add something. When you go to a restaurant and there's so much on the menu and you don't know how to choose, you can, it can be confusing. It's like, okay, why, what is going on? There's so much on the menu. What, what, what do I pick? And you ask everybody, what do I pick? It's because there's been added so many choices and so many options that it becomes confusing. So when it says he confused their language, it doesn't mean he confused their language. It means he added languages. He added more than one language. And what God does, he doesn't actually... God's not a subtracting God. God is not about subtraction. He's not about division. He's not about, he's about unity. He's about addition. He's about multiplication. He's about those things. So when God wanted to bring confusion to them, he didn't subtract from them. He didn't take from them. He didn't withdraw from them. But what God did is he added to them. The word that actually means confused means that he added to them. He added to them and it brought confusion. The end result of God adding to you, if you don't know how he comes to this equation, it's going to bring confusion. So God brings addition to them in this Tower of Babel, and they they are all in, engaged in new languages, and it confused them. While they were doing this, this is what Nimrod was all about, was this, this God of mammon, this plan of mammon, this plan of tearing down the system of God in order to build his own system. Now, mammon is one of the it's seven deadly sins, you know, seven deadly sins. There's a, there's, there's the sin of greed and the sin of greed is also associated to the sin of mammon. And we have to understand that mammon is, is in its very essence, um, a, a deity, an entity. And so when we, when he's, when God's saying, don't serve both me and mammon, he's not saying don't have money because in the Hebrew word, in Hebrew word, if you're going to describe the word donkey, is the same as is 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 material, right? Material. There is a there is a term of material and money that's in the Hebrew language, which is mammon, right? So we have to understand that mammon is associated to money in exchange, as a donkey is 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 associated to. It's a vehicle, but in the kingdom of the Babylon, the kingdom of darkness, money is associated to it as if it is a deity, enabled to empower me to get. Right. And so we cannot serve mammon, but we can have mammon. We can have money. We can have material that helps us like a donkey exchange or do our work or whatever it meant. But it's not what we serve. It's what we use, what we cause to serve us. And so when we're looking at money mastery or mammon mastery, you have to understand that mammon mastery is not about serving a God, but causing this thing that that God would want me to have a heart for to cause it to serve me. I'm going to use money to serve other people. The Bible says in verse 9 of this whole this whole Luke 16, it says, use unrighteous mammon to gain friends, to get friends, to cause friends to come, to actually buy and build relationship with friends. Now, if you go back and read all of this in context, you'll see it in the wonderful stewardship strategies of God, that God wants you to be a wise servant that knows how to govern mammon, that knows how to deal with it, knows how to use mammon to build friendships, knows how to use mammon to build relationships, knows how to use mammon to build connections and networks. But God doesn't want you to, to be used by mammon. God doesn't want the spirit of mammon to control you. So today, we're going to break the spirit of mammon. Is that okay? We're going to break the spirit of mammon. We're going to break that the mindset of greed or fear of getting money or fear of having money because it may lead me to greed. That's all the spirit of mammon, that, that the spirit of mammon tells a person who has righteous values not to go for money because it will lead them to a greedy, greedy place. And it tells them to be reserved. It tells them to be insecure about it. it tells them to be question whether or not they, they, um, that whether or not they can go to their next level. I want you to know all of those things that would try to get up and say, well, I don't, I can't, I don't want to be too rich or whatever it is. I'm, a, you know, money's evil. All of that stuff is a false teaching. And we need to have right teaching that says money is usable material, just like a donkey is usable material to God. Now, money is not this thing that's supposed to be mastering us where we go and we work the rest of our lives for money. I'm here to tell you that it is not God's will that you spend the rest of your life working for money. 
It is not God's will that you exchange your time for dollars. It is not God's will for this. It is not God's plan for you to spend your life, your purpose, your plan, and your destiny exchanging bucks for time. Time and bucks, that's not the will of God. That's why you're a business person. That's why you're an entrepreneur. That's why you're launching your business and you're writing your books and you're getting your speeches together and you're getting your coaching system together and you're you're 10xing your business and you're starting your, your fame launch, whatever you're building, you're doing it because the realization is God does not want you to exchange time for dollars. That is the mammon system. That is the system of mammon. God has called us to be people, individual skilled, that we can take our trade and use that trade in helping the society that we're in, not exchanging time for it, but changing and exchanging lives, helping lives, helping lives. The very reason God wants you and I to excel in this is because we get to serve humanity, not serve mammon. We get to serve humanity, serve people the love that they need, serve people the, 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 the grace, whatever they need, whatever they need from you, serve them. And when you serve them, that revelation is going to manifest the, the money that's necessary for you to ride on the material instead of the material leading your life. None of us should have in us the ability or the inability to make a decision because of money. There should not be one decision that you and I come to that we can't make because of money. All of us need to be able to say, you know, I wanna take my family to this vacation and I don't care how much it costs. All of us, I want to be able to provide this for my kids. I want to be able to do this for my family, whatever it is. And I don't care how much it costs. None of us should make a decision of how we treat our family or we treat our friends or the life, the life blessing we want to be to someone because, and, and then go and fa- figure out whether or not we can afford it. That is not the way that God intended his believers, his Christians, his kingdom people to live. God himself does not live that way. God does not go, you know what, I'm going to send my son, can I afford? it. I'm going to do something. I'm going to create the heavens and the earth. Do we have enough material for it? He did not have that behind him. What he had in front of him was a vision, and he had the resources to make that vision happen, and that's why we need to destroy the spirit of mammon. We need to overcome the spirit of mammon because you are called to do things, and you're not supposed to go and say, can I afford it? You're supposed to know, I can afford it because it's in my heart. If it's in my heart to have this vision, to to be able to take people, to, to do whatever I've got to do to to help people. I'm here to serve people and serve God, and I'm not here to serve mammon. So mammon will not have anything to say with how I'm going to live my life or how I'm going to be a blessing to this world. Say amen to that. I want you to get that because when we realize that we have to get our our minds right around the the mammon mastery, and when you understand mastering mammon, mastering mammon, mastering the art of being able to take the material and use it to bring change to people's lives. That's mastery. That's mastery. Now I'm going to take this money, this billions of dollars, and I'm going to go and rescue, I'm going to go and rescue children from, from, from slavery. Well, it, I'm going to take billions of dollars. I'm going to now be able to hire whatever I need to hire, bring in whoever I need to bring in, build whatever kind of housing I need to bring. I need to bring the best educators, those the best psychologists to get them once they come out of the human trafficking. We've rescued them. We've turned the hearts of the business people. They're now finding a different business. They don't need that business anymore. Now we have the we have the hearts. These people need now cleansing. They need new mindset. They need new training. They need new skill sets. We bring them in. Now we're able to do it and we're not able to, now we're not thinking how are we going to do it. Now we have the money behind us because we can just dream of how to fix this problem. We are having such a hard time about how to fix problems in the earth because we don't actually have people dreaming about how to fix problems without resource so it, resource issues. We need to get past the resource issues. So the spirit of mammon has been controlling the the dreams of our and our destinies and how big we can dream because we are limited in resources. We're going to get that resource taken care of so that we can do what God's called us to do. And so the comparison of God and mammon is very important. Two gods demanding attention from worshipers. Two gods demanding attention from worshipers. I can tell you, not for condemnation, not for guilt. If you spend 70 hours, 60 hours, 40 hours a week, and you do that for until you retire and they give you a golden, a golden lighter, 
or golden watch, if that's what you do, if you end up doing that, you have served mammon all the days of your life. You need to be in a position where your skill sets are really being paid for and you're really being able to get an exchange for the gift that's on your life and that's not exchanging dollars for your hours. Don't give your life to that. Don't give your life to that. Don't give your life to that. Your life demands more, the gift of God on you. The great doors that are in front of you demand more than that in from you. And if you've given a lot of your life to that already, it's time for you to jump off that mammon trail and jump into the kingdom trail and say, God, give me the words, give me the message, turn my message to my message and my mess into a message so I can build, write a book, so I can build a business, so I can do whatever I need to do so I can bring change in this earth. I know you have bigger dreams than that. I know you have bigger dreams than going to work every day. You have bigger dreams than, than, than how you want to show your family the life that you want to give them. You have bigger dreams than, than these things. And in order to get those things, you have to know I'm going to serve God with my skills. I'm going to serve God, not by just saying kumbaya, but I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make all kinds of money and I'm going to put mammon under my mastery instead of spending my whole life mastered by it. And we have subtle ways that we've been mastered by it. We've been mastered by it. We have these subtle ways that we've just, the we've allowed the system to control us. The Babylonian system is a system of worship and control and we need to break that. We need to step out of that. And one of the things that you find in the Babylonian system that was one of the, the biggest aspects that it's easy to look past and not realize how how much of a, of a mammon system we live in is in, in Genesis 11. Write this one down for me. Genesis 11, verse 3. And they began saying to each other, let us make bricks and, and harden them with fire. In, in this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for, for mortar. I want you to get this. The, the, if you notice when the Babylonian system is in charge, when you notice that mammon is in charge, it tries to make everybody a brick. It tries to make, it tries to formulate everybody into a same, you got to have the same, same shape, the same, the same aspect, Everyone's the same, everyone has to dress the same, everyone has to do the same, everyone has to talk the same. It's like right now, the Babylonian system trying to make everybody the same, you know, you know, every, everything, right? So try, when you realize, if you look at communism, you look at socialism, it tries to make everybody the same. When you look at any system that is under the control of Babylon, even if you go into the systems of the rich and the famous, the rich and the famous, they want everyone to be and look the same. If they're not the same, then you don't really fit in. Well, that's we don't care about that system. We care about affecting change, but we're gonna take all the money that's necessary to bring about change. And if we end up hanging out with you, that's fine, but I'm not, I may not look like you, I may not sound like you, you're not gonna corrupt my morals with your company, right? So, so you have to understand the brick mindset, the mindset of everyone has to wear the same uniforms. Everyone has to dress the same. Everyone has to say the same. Everything has to do the same. That's, that's the Babylonian, that's the mammon system. And what God always said is, I don't want you to build, I don't want you to build with bricks, formed, formed rocks. God says, what I want is I want you to go out and find uniqueness in each stone that you pick up. And I want you to look around at that stone and see how it fits on the wall instead of making it fit on the wall. That means you have to recognize the uniqueness in the, in the identity of each person. The Bible says that you are a living stone. I need to recognize the freedom and the liberties and the different angles and the different shapes of you so that we can find out how you fit, not how, not make you fit into my world. Well, we need to figure out where we fit together, where we connect, where we are able to do this together. When you realize that this brick mindset the brick mindset is everything that the enemy wants in our lives to make you something that you're really not, to, car, to, sh to, 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 to shave off your edges, to shave off your, to shave you, <laughs> to shave, make you a square brick, a, a rectangle brick. I want you to know that God's intention is for you to manifest a life that shows your uniqueness, that shows the uniqueness. The other thing they cried out is they, they said, this is going to make us famous when we fit in. 
Can I tell you, I'm going to be famous. You're famous. We're famous not because we fit in, but because of our uniqueness. Everyone that is going to be famous is going to be famous because of your uniqueness. But there's a lie that says if you fit in, you'll get there. And I want you to know you're going to have to show your uniqueness. You're going to have to reveal your uniqueness. When I teach on branding, we're not branding is not about how you fit in, how you look like everybody else. Branding is about how you look different. What's the uniqueness of you? What's the significant difference? And let's find that difference and let's hone in on that difference. Let's focus on that difference so that you're separated. So he's and then it's it is and the people were united around their that that their plan, their plan. They have one language and one unity, and nothing was impossible. We talked about that. So the spirit of mammon, the spirit of mammon, the per, it's mammon personified, is it has the ability to lure you a person into loving money. And it starts with not loving, it's not, it's not because a person's greed. Some of the most greedy people, I know people think that, you know, greedy people are just rich people. But some of the most greedy people I've ever encountered are poor people. People who don't have enough money and they're greedy. They don't share. There's nothing to give. They, 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 they don't add supply. They take. Um, they, I mean, poor, poor poverty is not a holy thing. I've never found poverty to be holy. Come on, somebody. Poverty is not a holy situation. God, if poverty was holy, he would have had a whole quarter of poverty in heaven. But everything you read about heaven, there is no poverty in heaven. There's no tears. There's no crying. There's no. Every time you find poverty, a kid's crying. Children are crying. I've never seen poverty and children not crying. Children are crying. Children know how to play, and they'll find anything to play with. I've been to the Tijuana dumps and worked with ch children in Tijuana dumps, and they will kick a little. They will kick a little plastic bottle if they don't have a ball. Children will make will find. But when it comes to hunger time, when it comes to you know being t to needed and supplied, children will. If there if there's children crying, that's a problem. And we know that poverty poverty causes people to cry. I don't, I don't think that God's intention, I know God's intention is not that we would be poor in the natural. We should be humble, poor in spirit, but not poor, not poor in the natural. I mean, I'm telling you, when you go to the dumps and you work with these people in different, dif different scenarios and their lifestyle, the Tijuana dumps, their lifestyle is they live in the dumps, they work in the dumps, they capture whatever people's throwing away to try to ca capture anything in it to make a little money. They are in this situation where they um they 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 cannot live their life without living in the dumps now that's not that's not god's intention that's not god's will that's not god's plan and and the the real the realization is god's looking to raise up people who will make a difference but you can't do it just in a good hope and a dream you're going to need to have the wealth that's that's necessary to bring about change for these people then and, and it's going to take education it's not going to just take money it's going to take education as well it's going to take a lot of other aspects but we have a lot of those aspects already handled and we don't have the money the money issue handled as the body of christ and so we need to get the money issue handled so that we can truly help the people we're supposed to help and so in babylon the system babylonian system mammon will make all things possible under its own control if you think about it I go, I like, I go to Vegas. When I go to Vegas, I mean, there's nothing really that those people imagine when they're going to build on the strip that they just can't do it. They just do it. They just build. And so money in the mammon system makes everything possible. The movies that are being made, the things that, you know, so mammon has the ability, if you're unified under it, it makes it, it makes things possible. The same that we saw in Babylon. He says, if with this unity and with this spirit, with the heart that you guys have, everything's going to be possible. Unifying around a singular vision and a singular language. That same language, the same vision, having the same understanding. In the kingdom of God, with God, all things are possible. Now, we must understand that in this, we need to know that God wants to make all things possible for us, and he wants to be the one, not the Babylonian system, not this system that's out there. In 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I want us to capture this because mammon wants us to love money. God wants us to love people. We don't love money, we use money. We don't love it, we use it. In the spirit of mammon, in the mammon system, the Babylonian system, we, we are trained to love money. And we don't act like we love money. We act like it's because we know it's wrong. But the fact is, is the, if you look at the prison system, the prison system is full. 
in what it is. I mean, it's overcrowded. Most of those people are not in there for anything other than money. Most of those people are in there for greed that led to murder, greed that let some someone stole something. I'm gonna they're they're in a they're in a a gang that that they control a block that controls the money. I'm telling you, it's all money surrounded. People don't go to jail just because they wake up and they love porridge. People go to jail and go to prison because they have schemes for money. And when you realize that these things are all controlled by the spirit of mammon, the spirit of Babylon. God's intention is not is that we don't live that way. So when you realize that poverty, crime, uh, most of the ills of the world have this mammon system, they have this mammon surrounding, the love of money is somewhere in that root of all evil. And if you find that there's evil happening, follow the money trail, you'll find that there's evil happening if there's evil people associated to. Is money evil? No. Money's not evil. Money's a tool. Money is not evil. It, it's, it's, not, it's like saying, oh, my spoon was evil. It got ice cream on it and it, put it, it shoved it in my face when I'm on a diet. Come on, that's, there is no way that spoon is evil. Now, is ice cream evil? No. Well, could be if it has too much sugar. It could be very destructive poison. But the fact is, is the spoon's not evil. The spoon is led by the values of the person. Right when you realize the money is just like a spoon, it is no different than a spoon in a sense. It's a utensil. It's utilitary, and I've got to use it in order to build, pay my bills. If I want to have lights, want to have heat, pay my bills. Right? It's you. It's 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 a it's a utility. When you realize that money is not thing something that I should love. Oh, I I love my heat, but I don't love my heater. I do love my heater. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> I appreciate my heater when it's cold. It's starting to get cold up in here. I actually appreciate my heater right now, but I don't love it. The realization is when we get into this place, when we get into this place that we need to realize that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, this this is very clear, and you've heard it, and you, if you haven't, you should hear it from me right now is that the Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So when we put it in its right proper category and we put it in its proper place and we don't allow the spirit of mammon and the spirit of Babylon to control us through loving it, we want it so badly that we're willing to do anything for it. We're willing, we're wanting this, we want it so badly, we're willing to steal for it. We want it so badly, right? There's this want of it that is so bad that I'm willing to do whatever. That's what, that's a formation of love. I want it so badly. Well, I want to be extremely, extremely wealthy, but it's not that I want to be extremely wealthy so I can sit around and roll on the bed, but I have, I have goals that are associated to changing lives with that wealth. I have goals that are associated to changing the world with that wealth. Well, I want to change the world, but I know I have a utility that I need to capture, which is going to be the funds. All right, so the love of money is not the root of all evil. When you realize, when the, not, money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all, all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, from faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So if you love money more than you love faith or God, then you will go and serve money. I've watched many people, in, in some of my masterminds, I've watched people who come in with the right perspective. They're, they're in this one, this super humble place. They're growing, their business is growing. And the next, you know, their business is taken off. They're just exploding. Now they, 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 they don't come to the mat. They're at the mastermind sometimes. And, but then what I find is that they spend a lot of time missing church now. And they spend a lot of time going out there on the ski dues. And now the lifestyle that they always wanted to live, they live in place of living and serving God. And that's not what I think is will of God. I think, and I find that their lifestyle ultimately um, has been taken over by money and not taken over by faith. We should never allow money to take over our lifestyle. We should have faith take over our lifestyle. And we use money in the utilitarian the, to be to utilize this 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 opportunity in this lifestyle. So when we realize that God wants us to 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 do this, we we do put God first. And in this doesn't mean we shouldn't have vacation. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have ski or we shouldn't have yachts or whatever the thing you want. But you should know 
<laughs> who got you there. It wasn't just that you know how to work the system and I'm in business now. Well, now you know how to work the system in your business, but if you do that and you, 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 you're gonna pay the dues in worship to that system. You must keep your worship with God and then allow the system to be worked by you. God knows it, that knows this system. God has, understands this system. And he says, if you treat it like a donkey, instead of like a God, and get it to you, use that donkey to carry your load. That, 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 that's a beast of burden. Put your, put, your, put your burden on it and carry your burden places. Use it like a donkey. That's why mammon and, and donkey and material are associated in, its, in the language. So when you realize that money is only a donkey to carry your burden, and it needs to carry your burden here and it needs to carry your burden there, but you're not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be a burden on you. Don't you dare carry your donkey. Let your donkey carry your burden. And so get into this next place. Now, mammon functions with poverty and pride. The spirit of pride says, I worked hard for this, right? The spirit of pride says this. The spirit of poverty says money is evil, but I really need it, right? This is the wrong aspect. I'm, money's evil. That is really wrong. That that's, leads more people to poverty than you know. Money's evil, but I need it. Everybody that's poor needs it. The spirit of gratitude says, thank God for providing for me skills, ability, dream, vision, and money to accomplish it all, right? The blessings are on my life. So when you realize that God wants you to walk in this, we're going to look at another scripture in Luke 16, 11 says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, if you've not been faithful in, uh, with unrighteous, in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? Now, this tells us the, 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 the concepts that God uses with money. Concepts God looking at, he looks at everything about with your faith, right? So when a person has an understanding that my faith, my faith in over a period of action, over a timeline of action, is considered faithfulness. Keeping my faith, being strict on myself in these certain things. Uh, there was a minister, he was he was preaching on faithfulness, and he goes, what does faithfulness mean? I'm sitting on the front row, and I just finished doing research on faithfulness, and the actual definition of faithfulness is to be strict on yourself. And I said, to be strict on yourself. He goes, oh, no, no, that's not it. <laughs> I'm like, is it the dictionary? It is it to be strict on yourself. When you realize that God looks at people who are strict on themselves, people who know how to take care of their bank account, people who know how to handle their money, people who don't allow their emotions to be controlled by money, people who don't have these emotional shopping sprees. God wants you to wants to see how do you handle money? How are you handling your business? How are you handling your life? Be good stewards and be faithful with unrighteous mammon. Do you take care of the things that you get? You get a new car, do you just go ahead and run it into the ground? Or do you take care of it? God's looking at, are you faithful with that unrighteous mammon? Is it in control of you? Do you look down on other people who don't have the same kind of car you have? Do, do you like that people look up to you because you have that car or the house? Right, Whatever that may be, that is God's looking and goes, well, how is this person handling the unrighteous mammon? Because I want to give them true riches I've given them a little bit. I'm 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 ready to go past the the ma the unrighteous mammon stage. I want to get into the true riches of God, right? Which is not only just having a lot of money, but having the vision. I want God to tell me what He wants me to work on. I want Him to say, you know what, Tracy? I gave you all of this money because we're going to go over here and we're going to stop this and we're going to start this. We're going to stop something and we're going to start something. When you really are in God's plan, he's asking you to start something for him. And he's asking you to stop something for him. And I, I, we spent the last two days or well, this, 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 the, the two days of, of our services, revival services on, you know, on, on Yom, well, what was it? Yom, Yom Kippur, we, where we were, the question was, what are we going to start with this wealth? And what are we going to stop with this wealth? What are we going to start? What kind of programs are we going to start to help people? What kind of program, what kind of ills are we going to stop? When God starts to invite you into those things, that's when you're stepping into the true riches. And I believe, now I, don't, I don't believe just the spiritual stuff is the true riches. I believe the true level of rich that he wants to give us is at that level. 
at the level of whatever ills we want to stop. I believe unrighteous mammon is when God gives me more than enough and I'm considered a wealthy, rich person in my personal life and my life is, is elevated and he's doing great things. But I don't believe he's invited me into true riches yet until I'm able to be invited into rooms that, that are dealing with bigger problems than my whole life than my whole, whatever my whole family is dealing with. I want to be invited to rooms that God's looking and going, I want someone to deal with this problem. I want God to invite me. I think that's where the true riches are going to unfold for me. So therefore, I'm going to be faithful in the way I take care of my house. I'm going to be faithful in the way that I take care of my, my body. I'm going to be faithful in, in the food that I eat. I'm going to be faithful, right? Because if I'm faithful in unrighteous mammon, he's going to then put me in a position where he says, now, Tracy, I've seen how you've been faithful. Money doesn't have you. You, you, you use money properly. Money is not controlling you. You control the unrighteous thing. You know it's unrighteous, but you still know how to use it. Right. And now I'm going to take I want you to take that unrighteous mammon and we're going to now build some big things in the earth. I want to be invited to the riches of God. How about you? Then Luke, Luke 19, as we start to barrel down on the end here, giving you lots of scriptures. Luke 19, 17 says this. And, and he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful with very little. Have authority over 10 cities. I think that we, we should recognize that God's looking at faithfulness as something to, to be recognized in us. So when you're being faithful with paying your bills, you're being faithful with making sure that you take care of your employees, you're being faithful with good tips. I believe, being, I believe, I believe giving good tips is a faithful thing. You're being faithful with good tips. You're being faithful with, with these things. And God sees how you handle money and that you're not greedy. You're not, you're not perverted with your money. You're just, you, you, you stre you're strategic. You use it as an opportunity, a means to help and means to a proper end. Then I believe God says, okay, I'm not only inviting you in to something, but I'm giving you authority over something. We look at this verse 17, he says, and you've been faithful with very little have authority over 10 cities, have authority, have authority. I believe God's looking for opportunity to give authority to people, not only at the end when, you know, this whole scripture that this Luke 19 is talking about occupy until I come, which is do business until I come back. Well, he wants us to know that there, there is, there is a sense of faithfulness that he's looking for. And when it, that faithfulness is there, there's going to be reward to that faithfulness. All right. So we're going to deal with one more N nutty, n nutty gritty is that n nitty gritty uh we're gonna look at this in first timothy six. First timothy six this is one that people love to use as a reason that we should not have money and the reason we should be poor because god doesn't like you know god doesn't like you know wealth to first timothy six says this in verse six but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is the force that keeps you from greed and comparisons. Now that word, that contentment, just the idea of godliness with contentment. Now this this is important. Is great gain. Now there there is a there is a Greek. We're gonna we're gonna kind of break this down in the Greek words for, for a second. Uh, the word contentment in the Greek is is our, our autarkas, and it means sufficient for oneself, strength enough, possessing enough need and needing no aid. Possessing enough and needing no aid. It's an independent of external circumstances. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I actually have enough. I actually have everything I need. I don't, I don't lack in any, this is not a word, this word contentment doesn't mean I lack anything. It means I have what I need. I have everything I need. It's, it's the same word that's used when, um, when Paul writes, he says, um, he says, I've learned to abound, I've learned to abase in all things. I learned to abound, learned to abase. I've learned to be, I've learned to be content. I learned to have enough. I have enough. In every circumstance, even if, if even if I didn't have as much as I normally had, it was enough for everything I had need of. And then it, he says, but I've also learned to be abundant. I've had abundance, and that was enough for what I needed then too. So getting into this place of contentment to know that you never have a lack. 
I think that's very important that godliness with no lack is great gain. Now we're going to break down the other words. Now that word great is also the word megas, great, megas. So godliness with never having lack, never, never lacking anything, never needing external aid. I'm completely supported already. I'm self-sufficient. That's something that I believe that Christians need to get to, to a place where we're self-sufficient. We're actually not looking for another, our, another handout. We are actually, our businesses are flourishing. We're, we're moving forward. We're effective in this. And then we actually are able to be provided for no matter what. So it may be a skinny season, but in the skinny season, I have more than enough. It may be a season where there is a recession. This is what I'm thinking of when he says there's a bounding and basing. There may be a recession. I may have to go and work my tent business. He had to go and work his tent business for a moment, right? Remember, he had a business and his business was tent making. Well, that was his skill set. He went and worked with some other people and partnered with them. And his skill set was making tents. And so he, even in his lack, he had, he had a skill set that he was able to make money and he didn't lack anything. Right. And so we need to know that there are skill sets that God has given us that should give us a place of contentment. I'm going to be provided for my books. My books are selling. My books are selling. I don't actually I don't actually with my books. I mean, these books are on on different platforms, but they just sell. I mean, I was looking at books, book sales come through last night. I'm not pushing. I'm not the books that we're selling. I'm not even pushing. I have no funnels on them. I have nothing going on. They're just selling. Well, when you realize that that is a place of contentment, I like being in a place where my books are just selling. They're just out there selling. I have 13 books and they're selling. Products are selling. I like when resources are selling. Well, that is now I've able to do the godly thing was to be in a place of contentment, godliness with contentment. I need to be in a place of contentment. Well, I wanted to continue to go. I wanted to grow when they increase. I want my other businesses just to continue to increase and grow. Right? And as these businesses increase and grow, they should be like just like this, contentment. I'm not I'm not out hustling. I'm not out I'm not I love this. I love I love that I can actually take the time out of my schedule and do this. I can come and do this. This is this is a support. This is this is something that I love to support the people who want to go to the next level, who want to learn, who want to grow, and who want this this. So my lifestyle actually affords me to be able to just have a Thursday. I was thinking, man, I have a lot of Thursdays open that I can just go and do some filming, and I think that's great that I have that open. And then later I'm going to go and I'm going to do my flight lesson. I'm going to go and fly, and I'm going to have fun, and I'm learning how to chart courses and do that kind of stuff. I'm excited about it. And then tonight, and then, you know, I have a pretty, pretty flex day today. <laughs> I'm quite excited about it. Well, the realization is, is you need to be able to have that contentment in your life that it's enough. I have enough. I'm not, I don't need to go and force anything. I'm, there's projects, there's things, and I'm working, but I, I don't actually have to, I don't have to grind. I don't have to hustle. I just, I'm in my hustle, my grind. This is it. I love it, right? So make sure that you understand that you're in this. So he says there's great gains, M mega great gain, great gain. Now I want you to see this word, these two words, mega, mega, and then the second word is gain. Purismo, purismo is the word gain. Purismo is an interesting word because purismo is not a you're physically, emotionally gained. It's 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 gained by your. It's a furnishing. Um, it's it's actually supply, and the best definition is. This is the Greek word parismo, money getting acquisitions, gain. So what he's saying in this scripture, if we read it in context and just breaking down the, the Greek words there, but godliness with enough being content knowing that you are supplied that you know that godliness with contentment is great game then he goes on and talks about how and we, we you should read it for yourself but he, we're going to run out of time here he goes on and talks about how people have tried to come into the body of christ because they have seen the great gain that takes place when you become a person who is godly and you are working with your skill set and you're content with it it brings great money getting. That's that. That's that word, par parismo, money getting, the great money getting. 
So God, God never said, don't, don't actually go and get a lot of money. He actually, in the scripture saying, if you're godly, you have godliness with contentment, those two things are going to cause great money getting to come to you. There's going to be great, there's going to be a lot of money attracted to you because you're not actually out there trying to serve the mammon system. You're out there serving humanity with the contentment, with the life that you have, with the love that you have, and it's going to cause great money getting to come to you. Study that out for yourself. You'll enjoy it. You'll love it. And so when you when you're when you're not happy, uh, when we're not happy with ourselves, if we don't have this this contentment, it's really going to be a challenge to make uh, people uncomfortable to be with us because people need to feel like when they're working with us, they like working with us, they trust us. They need to feel that they are going to connect with us. And so realizing that God wants you to step into this I'm enough place, this place I'm enough, but in that I'm enough, knowing that there is going to be more getting, more money getting, because you know I'm content and I'm godly, and I'm not going to give myself to this Babylonian system, and I'm going to rise above it. Amen. Hopefully that was encouraging to you. That's what I wanted to share with you today. You're going to overcome the spirit of mammon, not give in to the Babylonian system, not be a brick, but be the living stone that you're supposed to be, allowing the skill sets and the, the, the power of God to, to manifest in you and be able to use your gifts, your skills, your talent to not serve this system, to spend the rest of your life serving this system, but to literally get out of the system by actually controlling the system, making it your donkey instead of you being its donkey, you, you make it your donkey and you are able to allow this thing to serve you, to serve the vision, to master, be master over mammon instead of mammon mastering you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's fun. so much fun. We'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you so much. Hey, if you like this video, you'll also like this video here. And if you want to continue to receive content like this, just go ahead and push the notification bell, subscribe, and then share this. And then we will continue to get the word out and help people understand that God has a plan for them. Using the scripture, we'll go to our next level. We'll build something incredible and make his name great.